Please welcome Mark Logic's Executive Vice President of Products, Joe Pasqua. Good morning, everybody. I am so excited. Um, I got up this morning and I looked at my phone and I had a new Twitter follower. And, and it wasn't just anybody, it was Prince Harry. And I, I know it's real because it had a picture of him and, and it had a link for me to click on. So I'm, I'm just, I'm super excited about that. I'm also excited about the conference and, and this session that we're doing now. Uh, as Gary mentioned, what we're going to do now is I'm going to have four of our customers come up one at a time and um, tell their stories about how they're using MarkLogic, um, what their company needs were, what their business needs were, what the challenges were, what it was like. Uh, so you can hear from them directly. And I'm just going to ask a few questions, but it's really uh, their stage to tell you uh, their stories. And these are four IT professionals that uh, are, are really driving innovation in their organizations. And, and you know, I, I want to start with a really quick uh, experiment here. I'm going to say a phrase, and I want you to shout out the first word that comes into your mind. Don't think about it. Just the first thing that comes into your mind, just make it clean. Make sure it's clean. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to say a phrase, first word that comes into your mind. IT professional. <laughs> okay, the first thing I heard was pizza. Uh, the second thing I heard was overworked. I think I also heard nerd, um, which in this conference is a good thing. Um, the, the first word I had in mind was innovator. So when I look out at all of them, I'm looking at Mike Bowers. When I look out at all of you, uh, you're innovators. You're IT professionals, and you are innovating to drive your business forward. Um, and that's one of the really great things about working with all of our customers is the kinds of problems that you're solving and the way you're solving them are, frankly, really quite cool and very innovative. Um, but there's a second word that goes along with that. Uh, which I think a lot of people don't necessarily, you know, if you're at a cocktail party talking about IT people, this word might not normally come up, but it's gutsy. You know, if, if you're innovating in your organization and your organization has been doing the things the same way for 30, 40 years, and you're saying, hey, I want to do something different. I think we can improve the business by using this new technology or this new process or, or this new approach, that takes a lot of guts. You're putting, you're putting your reputation on the line for something that you believe in and something you believe will help the business. And that takes guts. And all four of the people that I'm going to introduce today are in that mold. And what I'm going to do is I've got my, my cheat sheet here. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, each of these folks up, we're going to talk for a few minutes, then uh, the next person will come up. And so it's not sort of a, a traditional sort of panel operation. Uh, and the first of those uh, is from a great organization, Credit Suisse. And our first speaker is Pranav Rao. Thank you. I'm going to hand this over to you. So, so Pranav, uh, Credit Suisse, huge global financial services organization, one of Fortune Magazine's most admired companies. Uh, you're in the asset management organization. So tell us a little bit about what that is and what you do there. Sure, I'll just give you a little context on Credit Suisse. So we're about 162 years old. We operate in about 50 different countries. We have 46,000 employees, and we come from 170 nations and we manage about $1.3 trillion in assets, right? So that's who we are. And uh, about three years ago, we went through some major restructuring, and Credit Suisse is really about five parts, right? So we have the Swiss Universal Bank, we have the Asia Pacific Bank, we have uh, international wealth management, we have investment banking in capital markets and global markets. So uh, we really service our clients through the Swiss Universal Bank, the Asia Pacific Bank, and international wealth management. 
um, and the other two units really support these functions. So I come from asset management, and asset management is a part of international wealth management. So asset management itself operates in about 21 different countries, and uh, we have, I think, close to about $400 billion in assets under management. So that's who we are. Okay, yeah. cool. And, and within asset management, when you're facing IT challenges, how do you approach them? Is it, is it IT driving the business? Is it the business driving IT? What, what's the approach? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the industry at large, the financial services, right, one way to kind of classify it is the buy side and the sell side. So depending on whether you're on the buy side or the sell side, the culture shifts dramatically within the bank. And the amount of investment available to your IT organization changes significantly. So asset management, I see it more as a buy-side organization, at least the way I've experienced asset management. Um, and, and so therefore, you know, it shifts the whole culture about how IT is viewed. So in the buy-side organization, why, you know, we've been through a whole iteration of building your own systems, building your own trading systems, accounting systems, and then you get to a point of scale where like, why don't I just go and buy this? Yeah. Why build a trading system when I can buy one? Why build an accounting system when I can buy one? Uh, and so we're now, I think, around 10 years down the road where you realize, well, if I can buy it, anybody else can buy it. Yeah. Right? So there's no real differentiation in buying a product, such as a trading system or an accounting system. So then what differentiates you? So we're now at that juncture where we're saying, okay, what do we do now as IT to really differentiate our business? And historically, me, I, the way I've kind of been managing my own career is really just giving business what they ask for. And we're seen as an enabler, and we've never really differentiated the business where we came from. And that's how we've been. But now I think we're at a point where like, okay, all the competitors have the exact same products. What do we do next? Right. So I think we as IT, at least me as a person, as an individual, I'm thinking, oh, it's, it's my personal responsibility to really go and disrupt or innovate my own business model. It's, I shouldn't just leave it to my business. So I think it's historically been a business-driven thing. Right. But now it's turning into an IT thing. But I'm also very fortunate because my business stakeholders happen to be extremely progressive very innovative. So they always keep me at the edge of my seat, uh, of my seat right? So it's, it's like I'm trying to play catch up to the vision. So it's also a good place to be. So you have it going both ways. You're trying to find IT approaches to differentiate the business, and the business itself is pushing you to drive forward. Exactly. That's cool. So um, when you're introducing a new technology like MarkLogic, something that, you know, is, as I said, it's not the way things were, have been done for the past 30 years. In, in the financial services industry in general and, and in your organization, w what is it like to do that? What are, what are kind of the, the cultural and people-related things that you have to deal with to make a shift like that? Sure. I think it'll just... Uh, um, so I really think it's, you know, we're trying to secure data in an insecure world. That's how I see it, right? To answer your question, I mean, we have, normally when we select products and technologies like MarkLogic, we talk about a use case, you bring the right tool into the organization, and then there's an outcome because of this particular uh, tool. Right. And MarkLogic obviously offers a lot of benefits in that space. And this is a very technical conversation, and I'm going to talk about everything but the technical piece, right? So uh, to me, it's really three things that lead to an outcome, right? So there's people, processes, and tools. You have the wrong people, you're, the most sophisticated tool doesn't work. You have bad processes, your tools don't work. So it's right. a whole trifecta there, or a bad tool with great people doesn't work. So to me, that's really uh, uh, the, the, full, the full triangle of success, right? But to, what I'm most interested in is the culture, because culture really impacts technology. Like I was saying, you could come from the buy side or sell side and you have a different viewpoint. That's one way to look at it. And the other thing is the, the industry, right? Uh, the industry right now, if you see financial services, we're clearly on the cusp of an, of an innovation or a disruption, right. be it from the fintech world or somewhere else. Um, I come from a business line that's also very profitable. So when things are profitable, you don't really care. So, you know, it, it's fine. It's going right. well. We have a lot of manual processes, and we've been successful for 162 years. So why not, right? Uh, the other thing is uh, the roles within an organization. You have various roles. You have auditors, regulators, traders, portfolio managers, accounting, uh, no, accountants, so all of them have vested interests, right, in performing their roles really well. So that's one aspect which really makes a product like MarkLogic, you know, you can bring a great product like MarkLogic in, but you really have to tackle that, right? And then you take, talk about location. We have a very rich ecosystem of vendors, so they have the, the vendors have the location strategies. We have our location strategies in terms of where we keep our employees and consultants. So if I go to certain markets, like the Swiss market where I'm in right now, 
it, you, you have certain skill sets and you don't have certain skill sets. So if I'm bringing in a product, I want something that's fairly generic. I don't want something so specific as a skill that I can operate out of a low-cost location. Right. Right, because when you go to certain low-cost locations, you get generic skill sets. So I want to be able to use XQuery because a lot of my .NET programmers know XML. I want to be able to use uh, jQuery because I have a lot of UI developers who understand JSON, right? Right. right. Um, I have a lot of SQL programmers, so they need a shot at this. Right. Some people want to go to Sparkle. So, and I don't want to buy five or six different products to do all of this. Right. I come from the buy side. Give it to me all in one place. Yeah. Right. So that's really what this is. Uh, the next one is actually my favorite, politics. I have been <laughs> guilty about this in a previous life in previous banks where politics is built into architecture, right? It is so prevalent. Because, and it, it's all for the good intention, but there is, you have to address the human element of vulnerability, right? You do want to protect data. I used to think as long as I owned a system in, in a company, I had a career. But I, now I know I need to have data in the system. Yeah. So, right? So, <laughs> so data, the way you historically executed the, these roles was, you have a SQL database, I'm just going to make another SQL database, copy all the data to mine and do whatever I want with it. Right. Can't afford to do that with MarkLogic. Because it is about integrating silos, and um, it's, I mean, you, you can't keep repeating MarkLogic installations that are identical to each other through all the companies. It kind of blows the whole purpose. Right. right? So to me, um, addressing that psychology, the human psychology of data is so critical because you have all these features within MarkLogic, you know? So for example, element level security. Oh, there's a whole new way of defining security and what it means to have data ownership. So you can have a shared infrastructure, and now I can define security models in a way where different groups within the organization can have access to their own data, but we still have one copy of the data. I don't have to make copies. Right. Right? So the whole, uh, I want to say, uh, the pissing war of data, <laughs> right? It's, it's really like, hey, this is mine. So to me, how do you kind of define that in MarkLogic? I think we have some new paradigms available within a system, like, a product like MarkLogic. Yeah. Uh, how does... Um, by temporality or um, you know, other features like redaction, how, how can I answer a regulator now? It completely changes the conversation. Right. Right. So I'm pretty sure we have sophisticated things that you can do within MarkLogic in, in the technical domain. But in the domain of the organization psychology, this is what I'm more interested in because this can completely sync the most sophisticated solution. Right. So that's what we're tackling within our organization. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, Gary was talking about uh, the mind shift. And I think that's really what you're expressing, too, is there needs to be a mind shift and a culture shift to really get the benefit of all these technologies as well. Exactly. And mind shift, you know what? If you have executive leverage over your organization, you can just mandate it and it happens. It's the easy one, right? Right. But what if you want to do it across multiple groups? Now right. you need buy-in, and getting buy-in is pretty hard. So um, I think of it as really accountability and control. People want to have accountability in their roles, and they want to have control over certain things. Right? And you really land up in two different places. You either get complete buy-in and people are happy, or you don't get any buy-in and people are unhappy. Right? At least this is a black and white thing where you know whether your sophisticated solution is going to gain adoption. Right. But as we started moving through a project, we realized there's like a third more dangerous state, which is they act like they don't know what hit them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like, we talked about the innovation, we talked about the vision, and you start realizing that innovation, vision, transformation, disruption, it's all great as long as it's in the future. Right, right, right. <laughs> I love that. Right? Yeah. So this is where we are. We're like in this whole big gray area of, oh my God, what are you gonna, my data is going away, yeah. right? Or I don't have full control. So uh, I, my mess, I, I would just have one request. If you're a technical person in this room and you're, you're gonna be doing something great in this conference, think about the human psychology of it. Uh, you can have the most sophisticated solution. You'll get nowhere without buy-in. And your success is an agreement reality anyway. We all have to agree that we're successful. And if I'm vulnerable about something or insecure about something, I'm just going to say you know, it wasn't successful. So you had the most, another way of saying it, a fool with the tool is still a fool, right? Yeah. So it's just, to me, that's this human psychology, uh, the organizational psychology is what we have to solve as part of our architecture for a great product like MarkLogic to work. That's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And, and Pranav's, Pranav's going to be around. Um, I, you know, there's so much more to talk about on this topic, so please feel free to hunt him down in the hallways and, and pick his mind. Sure. These conversations are best had in a bar, so... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right, thank thank you. you.
All right, so next we're gonna shift industries a little bit and I'm gonna invite up Rob Maxwell from Sony. Hey Rob. Here we go. So, so Rob, Sony, huge company, huge global organization, Fortune 500, uh, you're in, I, I learned today that you're in uh, financial services, I didn't know that. You're in entertainment, obviously, you're in lots of different businesses, electronics, everybody knows you for electronics. I love those little robotic dogs that oh, you yeah. make, those are yeah, awesome, absolutely. Ibo, they're terrific. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about where you are in the organization and what your organization does. Sure, uh, Sony as a whole is a, about a $77 billion organization, Sony Corp is based in Japan. I work for Sony Pictures Television, uh, which is a line of business within Sony Pictures Entertainment. And at SPT, we basically create and manage uh, the distribution of television content, television programming to uh, 190 different countries. Uh, shows like uh, Breaking Bad, uh, The Goldbergs, uh, SWAT, uh, Shark Tank, um, The Blacklist. Shows like that are Sony originated content that get monetized and distributed across the globe. So I work for SPT, SPE as our umbrella company adds motion pictures and home entertainment. So uh, motion pictures Jumanji is a, a Sony uh, movie recently, uh, did very well. Uh, Spider-Man franchise is partly owned by Sony Pictures. And that is one of those pure divisions to the other groups that you think. Right. So it's kind of odd to think that we're in there with a bank in Japan, but in <laughs> fact, Sony has financial services. It's quite large. And, and in your organization, what are some of the IT challenges that you're facing, both kind of historically and, and today in the present? Yeah, uh, probably not uncommon. And a lot of the things that were brought up here today um, resonate with us in terms of accountability, the political nature, organizational psychology, all, all of that kind of stuff. Um, what Sony has been faced with uh, within, uh, oh, let's see here. There you go. Uh, so what we've been faced with is um, data sprawl, uh, an aging uh, application landscape. Um, you would call it kind of a benign neglect of, uh, of landscape. And you position that against what is uh, a very innovative business. So just as a brief tutorial, in order to sell a TV show, there are really five dimensions that are involved. Uh, the first is product or title. So that's like uh, break, Breaking Bad or uh, The Blacklist. That's a title. Uh, there are thousands of them in our library that can be sold, and there's metadata associated with every title. It has a genre. It might be an action comedy, might right. be a thriller or whatnot. And those are all factors that go into deciding whether that's going to appeal to a television channel in Portugal or the Netherlands or Brazil or whatnot as we sell it. Uh, that's an important factor. That's the first dimension. The next is territory. So there are 190 territories to choose from. Start thinking about this as a cross product of values uh, as you look at the dimensions and, and uh, potential permutations of ways that content can be sold. So 190, 190 territories. Then there's the media. The media is, uh, for instance, uh, basic TV, which is you know, coming through the rabbit ears or your HD TV. There's also pay TV, which is cable television, direct TV, dish, so on. So where you're paying monthly to get access to that pipeline of content. Then recently there's SVOD, which is subscriber-based video on demand. So a lot of us are watching TV, it's come on strong. Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, those types of guys are SVOD platforms that give you that pipeline for a monthly fee that comes through the internet. So the number of media are expanding um, drastically. It's making our business extremely complex in, in, in terms of how the pie is, is cut up. There's the language that the show is available in. So in Portugal, are you gonna sell the Portuguese version, the Spanish version, or the English version? That's just another parameter in the sale. Then we move on uh, from media and language to the start and end dates that this intellectual property is going to be available. So essentially we're leasing content for use by mm. channels for a specific period of time. So the combinations run into the billions. In fact, in our relational database, we have many billions of rows of rights records that express, the, the, that are the structured manifestation of how this sale can take place. It's an extremely, uh, extremely complex um, data scenario. 
One of our executive stakeholders told us, as this business grows, the, uh, it's like a pizza. The pizza's getting a little bigger each year, which is great, the business is growing, but the shape of the pizza is changing. It's not a round pizza anymore. And you're cutting pieces to try and sell to Netflix and to sell to Sky B and to uh, HBO Olay. And then you've got to look back at the pizza and say, well, how can I cut this again to sell some more? So it's a, it's a very complex manufacturing and distribution challenge that, that we face. Um, and uh, we now take that to the backdrop of a legacy, uh, a legacy platform that, as you can see, has a 30-year-old mainframe in the middle. Uh, our mainframe guy also retired on us. <laughs> he, went to, he wanted to grow orchids, he told me one day. It's like, oh my God, you're kidding me. This is ridiculous. You know, we have billions of dollars and you control every dollar that's going through this system and you want to grow orchids with your wife. <laughs> so, and we have some curmudgeons in the business who don't really like spending money. So, you know, that's like a call to action. Yeah. You know? It's like, yeah. Joe wants to go sell orchids. Aren't you going to fund this project? So um, it's a 30-year-old mainframe. There's some Java applets in the stack. Um, one, one part of the complexity, as you can see, is on the, um, on the horizontal band, we've got uh, United States operating as a different business and international as a separate business. Well, those guys merged. So all of a sudden, it's almost like an M&A type of activity that's taking place. You have disparate processes, different systems, a lot of manual stuff going on into and out of that mainframe because the mainframe really couldn't change and keep up, keep up with the business. So we're facing a lot of landscape hurdles um, that takes us on to uh, our next uh, future landscape where, right. we use, where we use Mark Logic. Uh, we condensed the businesses into one, a global business, and then we retired the old systems that we didn't need anymore. <clears throat> and uh, in terms of our sales and finance systems, we picked the best ones and we said we're just going to upgrade them, we're going to make them better, and then we're going to introduce what we call a sales to finance hub in the middle that's Mark Logic based. So that's kind of the mediator of sales transactions and sales guys, uh, they like to dream, they like to forecast, they don't want to be held to their numbers though, the <laughs> finance guys have to, have to count the money, they have to make sure the money comes in, billing, collections, invoicing and all that. So we have a mediator type of application and system in the middle. MarkLogic was a good choice. One thing I'll comment though, at the start of this project, we called that middle box the conversion hub because we're Oracle based all over the place. And what we wanted to do was create a place where people could look at the data before it got ported back over to Oracle. Right. And uh, in that process, we got confidence with Mark Logic and said, you know what? We're grooming this data here. Let's stand it up here and let's write our application around that. And that became the sales to finance hub with Mark Logic. So that's awesome. Yeah. Hey, great. Thank you. Um, so, so just in the, in the last minute here, can, can, I've heard you use the term data river as opposed to Gary's data cesspool. Um, yeah. so, so what do you mean by data river? Well, uh, we're viewing our future use. It's kind of a notion right now, but um, a data river is fluid, obviously. It's a place, and, and in a number of our environments, we have SaaS applications and custom applications that all have to sit and work together well. Uh, the missing piece in those cross-application use cases is availability of the data in real time and fresh, fresh values of data that might happen from system A that's unknown to system B because right. SaaS provider A doesn't care about SaaS provider B. So we're looking at potentially using the APIs of these custom and SaaS applications, building a data repository or a data river where these applications can come and participate for what they need then other analytic uh, tools like a Tableau, for instance, can sit on top of this and provide reporting uh, to help us. We're finding that as we built these silos, we have the best of the best, but now we need to tackle the use cases for automated input from one to the other right. for global reporting and that type of thing. Right, cool. Hey, so um, thank you very much for that. And um, if you need an introduction to Prince Harry for any of your upcoming <laughs> I'm events, there, yeah, let me know. Absolutely. Thank you very yeah, thanks much. Thanks a lot. All right, see ya. All right, next I'd like to uh, welcome Len Hardy from Northern Trust up to tell us a little bit about what they're doing with MarkLogic. Hey, Len, thank you. So Len, I, I was, um, I knew uh, quite a bit about Northern Trust. I've been out 
to uh, your company a couple of times and met with a lot of your people at Marklogic World last year. But I was frankly kind of surprised to learn just how big Northern Trust is. And you know, you're, you're one of the largest financial institutions. You've been around for well over 100 years. I had to read this. I had to go back and double check that this was right. $11 trillion in assets under custody. Yeah. So yeah. you are a large financial services organization. We are. Um, we like to think of ourselves as either the largest small bank or the smallest large bank. Yeah. Right? <laughs> or somewhat, we're somewhere in there. But we were founded um, in 1889. Um, at that point, our founding principles were uh, service, uh, expertise, and integrity. And I'd like to think that 130 years later, those are still our principles, right? Um, we're a very, very client-oriented company. Um, client service is really the hallmark uh, of what we bring sort of to the table. Yeah. And, and um, you and I have spoken a little bit about the framework that you use for bringing innovation into Northern Trust. Could you just share that with everybody? Yeah, we don't like to do innovation at Northern Trust just from a technology purpose or just because innovation is cool, although it is totally yeah. cool, right? We like to do it because we need to um, bring a bit of business value. We need to provide value to the business. So everything that we do, every time we go out to this neck of the woods and talk to VC firms or um, talk to companies like Mark Logic, we're, we're going there with an idea of what is our problem for the business, what value are we going to bring, and how are we going to solve that problem? You know, we're always striving to build better software, more secure software, and very importantly, deliver it to the market faster. Right. And, and how do you do that? How do you identify the innovation uh, that you want to be bringing into the company and make that happen? We have a uh, part, part of our bank, we have a private equity firm, 50 South Capital, right? And they have some. Um, very close relationships with a lot of venture capitalists right out here uh, in, in the valley. So a couple of times a year, myself, my counterparts, uh, our CTO, our head of security, uh, we'll go out there and it's sort of like a shark tank little, uh, <laughs> little story there, right? They'll bring in uh, companies that are in various stages of their development. Um, some of them have an idea. Uh, some of them are actually going to market and we'll sit across the table from them um, and uh, learn about what they're trying to do. And we're always focusing on, on a certain thing. Uh, one, one time we might be looking at security companies because always, obviously in the center of our diagram there is how do we secure our environment. It's important to every other thing we do. Um, one time we'll be looking at uh, continuous integration or continuous delivery tooling because we want to be faster to market, right? And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll bring those companies back and we'll do a proof of concept. And if we get in early enough, we're able to actually um, change the way that they're developing their software to be more enterprise friendly, right? Mm. The benefit to these companies is, is, is they're in an enterprise and they uh, get to hear our input in terms of what would make it more uh, conducive to them selling to other enterprises, right? So we really like to get in early with these guys and steer their development of their application or their system or their technology into a way that will re really benefit us at the Northern Trust. And, and what's it been like bringing Mark Logic into the organization? Mark Logic was a lot farther along when we brought it in than a lot of the companies we're talking about, right? Um, we have actually, um, we're, we're actually utilizing Mark Logic as the core to part of our architecture. And a uh, shameless plug right now, uh, one of my uh, cohorts from Northern Trust, Maureen Penzenek, is a uh, solution architect at Northern Trust. And she's going to be. She is going to be doing a deep dive presentation into our architecture. So um, I will just stay at this level. She will dive as deep as anybody wants to go at that, right? Um, what we're doing is we're putting in an event-based, uh, real-time uh, infrastructure. Uh, we're building a foundation for the future. Uh, the heart of that is Mark Logic. Uh, as the system of record for a number of different applications that we're building within that transformative journey that we're on. So um, we've started this, uh, I think, the middle of last year. Um, it is a uh, probably a year and a half program. Uh, and um, when we're done, we're going to have an event-based, real-time, uh, mark logic-driven uh, infrastructure that we're going to be able to plug and play different applications into. That, that's awesome. And I've uh, fortunately been able to see a lot of the architecture work you've been doing. It's really progressive, really amazing technology. And, and when I think about that and think about kind of the fast pace of IT, what are some of your challenges sort of keeping up with that fast pace 
and bringing that into a large institution like Northern Trust. Yeah, you know what they say, the pace of change will never be as slow as it is today. Right? Yes. So uh, it's, only gonna get, it's only gonna get worse. And I think um, the way that we do that is some of the things that we've talked about already. You know, we have a number of different solution architects like Maureen who uh, work um, on the line um, engineering, building software that's gonna benefit our clients and our partners. A part of her time and the other solution architect's time is actually matrix managed into me as an enterprise architect, right? So they see the problems on the ground, right? They see the business issues that they can't solve or the hoops that they have to run through because they don't either, either have the right tooling uh, or, or the right uh, security in play or something that they can't deliver what they need to deliver. So that's all funneled up to me and that's what we use uh, as we go out and look at uh, solutions to those problems. Uh, I will say the other thing is, um, the other quote that I read which I think is very interesting is that um, literacy in the 21st century is not about reading and writing, it's about learning, unlearning, and relearning, yeah. right? So the people are a big thing here. The people um, have to have the skill sets uh, in order to uh, pick up these new technologies as they come in. Long gone are the days where we're gonna put together a three-week class with a teacher and a book, and we're gonna teach you guys about this thing, right? Because by the time we get that put together, by the time we hold that class, we're probably onto something else, right? right? Because the pace of change is never as slow as it is today, right? right? So it's all about being able to learn on your own. It's all about being able to uh, network with other people, come to conferences like this, uh, and uh, just sort of be a self-starter. And, you know, I, I think the, uh, the word you use, which I think is really important, is unlearning also. Right. It's that ability to say, okay, we've done it this way for a long time. That was fine. It worked for, you know, the situation we had at the time. I need to put that aside, unlearn those patterns, and right. do something new and different. Yeah, I'm an old mainframer too, so. <laughs> Boy, there are a lot of us. Yeah, there are. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Thank you, Len. I really appreciate you uh, joining us here today. And as I said before, Len's going to be around. Um, there's a lot more behind uh, what we were just talking about, so feel free to, to corner Len in the hallway. I've actually had somebody already say they want to talk to you, so okay. um, thank good. you thank very you. much. Thank you. All right, so last but not least, we have Damien Pelagaitis from Chevron joining us. Hey, Daniel. Thank you. Good to have you. So, uh, Damien, I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get this quote right because I was blown away by it. Um, there's a report from the World Economic Forum. It's out on the web. Um, anybody can find it. It says that digitalization has the potential to create around $1.6 trillion of value for the oil and gas industries, customers, and society. I was... 1.6 trillion is a big number. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about that and, and, and what that means and where that value is coming from. Um, yeah, that, that number is big. That's cross industry, of course. Um, so at Chevron, um, we, you know, we, we've saw that and we've actually um, been starting a program across the enterprise, um, not just with an IT, but as an organization as a whole um, to accelerate our digital capabilities. And so um, the program, it, you know, it's looking at a fluency across our business leaders all the way down to uh, the workers, and it encapsulates, um, you know, uh, investment in technology enablers um, like data science, I IoT, um, you know, field mobility, things like that. But it also is focusing on very strategic areas of the company that we think have the highest, uh, um, you know, yield, uh, you know, for value. And, um, you know, so things like, you know, data science obviously is looking at a whole bunch of, um, you know, vertical, you know, solutions. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, maintenance optimization, field worker productivity. Uh, so Chevron is an integrated oil company. So, uh, and what that means uh, for the non-oil and gas people out there is yes. we have a... Um, you know, a, a, a downstream presence, which is our finding and marketing, and our midstream presence, which is, you know, field logistics, you know, pipeline, um, and uh, supply and trading and things like that. And then upstream, which is a, a fairly large part of the business, and it's, it's everything from exploration, development, reservoir management, facility engineering, our capital projects, um, and um, drilling completions, and base business and operations. So base business and operations is like, if you look at IT, it's, it's the tail, it's the run and support, but it's really one of the most critical areas. Um, so we keep assets uh, you know, anywhere from a few years to decades, if not even longer. For those uh, familiar with our San Joaquin assets, we've had those for 100 years plus. Wow. 
Um, so, so, um, so, the, uh, so our investment is really looking at you know, a lot of different opportunities across all these areas. Now, I work in upstream, and my focus recently has been on base business and operations, so, and the field worker uh, productivity. So. And, and you've told us a little bit about um, field operations and all that's going on there. Could you share a little bit about the opportunity in, in field ops? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when you look at base business and you look at the, the main strategic drivers that we're after, it's about you know, reducing our OPEX. You know, we just got a, a lot like IT. We got to keep our costs down to run the assets. And uh, safety, safety probably our right. most important driver. Um, we, we, uh, we expose workers to hazardous locations all the time. So the more we can do to protect our workers in the field and or remove them from doing those hazardous activities in the first place is really important. And, uh, and then production optimization. We want to you know, create as much production as we can you know, uh, at the lowest cost. So we have to be smart. You know, uh, 20, 30 years ago, we could just take production out. It didn't matter how much cost because the oil price is so good. <laughs> uh, it's not the case anymore. We yeah. have to be very, very smart about what we do. Right, and um, you have some pretty ambitious programs and, and ideas for what you're gonna be doing out there. Can you talk a little bit about what those are and how you're, you're introducing those? Yeah, I mentioned uh, field, field worker productivity right. um, earlier. And uh, so field workflow enablement is a program that we started about a year ago. And uh, it's, it's essentially to give field workers more tools uh, to connect them to back office better. So if you can imagine, uh, if you're a field worker, you know, and you're probably in West Texas driving a, an F-150 with a dirty windshield, <laughs> and you're carrying a whole bunch of binders around with you that tell you all the procedures, all the checklists that you have to follow. Uh, you're, you're probably stopping in the office, getting your permits to work, getting your maintenance orders, and, and uh, you know, having your handover processes with, with, you know, the previous day's workers. And then you're heading out on the road, and sometimes you're driving for hours. And, uh, and so you may not be able to get back to the office till uh, later in the day or the next day. So uh, and until you're back in the office, you know, there's no visibility of what's going on while you're out in the field with you know, maintenance supervisors and whatnot. So, right. and nor if you get out there and you, uh, you, know, you see uh, you're expecting something, you find something that needs to be worked on, and you know, there's no ability to communicate effectively uh, through the workflows. So what we want to do is, is really automate the field worker uh, to the best possible means. And so what makes that challenging is um, data and, uh, right. and, and you know, being able to take workflows and put them on mobile devices. And, and, and there are a lot of disparity on the different type of systems we use. So, so connecting systems and, and data is the magic ingredient. So uh, you know, maintenance data, equipment data, and, and what gets complex is data is generated you know, a lot of different ways in the field. You have right. time series data coming up from sensors. You have a lot of different systems that have been constructed over time and that, you know, they have to work together and integrate together. So um, the challenges that we have is how to harmonize all this in real time. So we normally communicate through APIs with our SORs. Um, but when we start doing the SORs real are system of records, okay. so things like the Maximos of the world, so free manufacturing people, we um, will generally will interact with those and you know work with them directly on our mobile devices. Uh, but when we want to start scheduling, uh, you know, optimizing schedules and you know looking for insights while we're in the field, um, you know, being able to go up to equipment and look at you know what's the run to failure you know curves look like, maybe you know adjust them, maybe you move to an event based uh, scheduling versus a you know, time-based. And all of those things we want to be able to do real-time. So if you're out in the field with your mobile device and you're closing work orders and looking at opportunities to reschedule some of the activities in a day, um, or, you know, you may see something and you don't have the expertise to fully diagnose that, you should be able to open up a collaborative window with the people, you know, in our integrated operations centers where we have, you know, a great deal of expertise and get some coaching, you know, and then take that video, you know, communication and tie it to, uh, you know, a maintenance or inspection system record and save it. Um, but all that needs to be harmonized. That right. data has to be harmonized in the back end and, and uh, quickly, you know. So when you're on a mobile device, you push a button, you don't want to wait a whole long. So, you, you know, we're talking seconds. And so that's what we're using MarkLogic for, for field workflow enablement, is to provide that layer of abstraction to help, you know, move the data up to the mobile platforms and allow us to do all these types of insights and optimization on the back end. So, so, so Mark Logic, um, you know, Gary talked a lot about using Mark Logic to harmonize data. You were just talking about harmonization. How do you view kind of Mark Logic as fitting in in your current and future plans? 
Well, you know, I actually, uh, I texted Kenny earlier during uh, Gary's diagram. The operational data hub, you can pretty much take that and put it into our architecture. Um, that's where we see it. Uh, we have a pretty significant um, investment in big data um, platform. And so we see MarkLogic, you know, uh, working in between our system of records for that, that very, you know, high degree of transactional integration uh, and between big data. It allows us to, to come in and kind of a work workbench um, type of format and, uh, you know, use it to do those real-time types of analysis and optimization. Uh, result sets can you know, be given to our big data uh, platform so data scientists can use them. And, um, and the insights that we learn can be uh, read back into the system of records. So for rescheduling, we want that to go back into our maintenance, you know, systems. Hey, and just, just one last uh, question. Um, each of um, the three previous speakers mentioned uh, sort of the challenge and sort of cultural part of bringing in new technology. Is bringing in new technologies easy at Chevron? Um, uh, of course not. Um, so, <laughs> but, but I will say um, it, it's easier when you have business problems to solve. So, right. you know, it, it, at Chevron, we, we try all sorts of, of ways to get technology in the door, and we're clever a lot of times. Um, but, but bringing them in just for technology's purposes and then going out and looking for the use cases you want to solve, that never works. So what we generally do, and what, what we do with MarkLogix is our downstream folks, and there's a nice contingent of them out here, so thank you for coming, but they had invested in MarkLogix um, before you know, upstream and midstream, and so we were able to learn a lot from what they have already had done. And, then, um, and so what we, when we start seeing you know, some of the data challenges that we had, and, uh, and, and you know, when we talk about transactions like maintenance, and inspections, it's huge amounts of uh, narrative context. So it's not your mm. traditional yep, transaction. Yep, yep. And, and it's coming in from multiple sources. So Mark Logix, you know, does a really good job of, you know, you know, analyzing it and giving us, you know, confidence, you know, levels. So we, you know, know which one is, you know, the, the one that we want to keep as the, the final version. Um, but, but we, you know, so we had a set of requirements. So we had some business problems that we want to solve. And Mark Logix was a really good fit. And we were able to piggyback, piggyback on the work our downstream partners did. And that made it pretty easy to bring it in. It still had to go through all the traps that, right that any new technology does, you know, in terms of getting it as a standard and getting architects to include it in their target architectures, things like that. But um, it's a lot easier to sell when you're, when you're trying to fix a problem. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much, oh, Amy. I appreciate it. So I, I just want to thank again Damien and Pranav and Len and Rob. Um, there, there is, as I said, so much more to their stories than we were able to go through in just a couple of minutes, really just touch the surface there. So, so again, I, I recommend trying to uh, find them over the course of the next couple of days um, and, and hear more about what they're doing and share what you're doing. Um, you know, we hear two things consistently about the value of this conference. One is the technical content and two is connecting with your colleagues at other organizations, learning about what they're doing, learning about uh, how they're innovating and using Mark Logic. So, so really want you to take advantage of that and the great resources they have. Uh, so once again, thanks to all of you. Okay, um, I've got one more thing. Uh, actually, I have three more things. Um, but I've also got 14 minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do three things very quickly. Good news is there's much more information about all these three things um, throughout the rest of the conference. So you've seen the operational data hub. You know it. You love it. If you don't, you will by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, so, you know, one of the great things about it is uh, you can load data as is. Um, and we've got really good tools like the MarkLogic Content Pump, MLCP, and the Data Movement SDK that really know how to get data into MarkLogic efficiently. They can use all the nodes in the cluster and parallelize the operations. Really great technology for getting the data into MarkLogic. But that data ultimately has to come from somewhere. It's coming from, you know, relational or a message bus or, or even files in the file system and, and usually from multiple places. Um, so what I want to tell you about today is a new introduction for MarkLogic. I want to tell you about our new data flow ecosystem. 
And what we're doing is giving you a way to get access to hundreds of processors, connectors, templates, flows, to get your data from those sources into MarkLogic connected with our tools like MarkLogic Content Pump and the Data Movement SDK, and do it with a really nice graphical interface. So this is a really simple example. You're gonna see this demoed tomorrow afternoon. This is just a simple example where you can put a flow together that extracts data from a relational database and moves it into MarkLogic. You can take each of these operations, drag and drop them, connect them together, and have it build that flow for you automatically. And then you can take those flows and encapsulate them in templates. So the next person can just drag that template on, use it directly. And it's a really great ecosystem that we're connecting with from the Apache Foundation. We've built an integration with Apache NiFi. And Apache NiFi was built for this very process. It was built to automate the flow of data and do that with a graphical interface. And out of the box, it comes with not just connectors to lots of those systems like relational databases, but it comes with integrations to systems like Kafka and Spring. So all of the things that those connect to automatically now you have access to drag and drop with MarkLogic. So huge ecosystem that's being added to every day and that you can add to. All of this is open source and that we can add to because all of this is open source. And we're taking that technology and making it available today. In fact, it was out on GitHub previously, but we just didn't publish the URL. So it was available before today. Um, so if you go to the MarkLogic GitHub repo, you will see our fully supported integration with NiFi, no cost, pick it up, start using it today, point and click your way from relational, from Kafka streams, from CSVs on your disk into MarkLogic. And thank you. This is really great. Um, so it's a great technology, a great enabler. Of course, if you use other tools, you can still use them. They work just fine. Um, but we're supporting uh, Apache NiFi out of the box. And we, we did that and we chose NiFi for a couple of reasons. And, and one is if, if you look at the data hub, it's all built around data flows and data flow processing. And, and NiFi has very much the same model. So we think there's a really nice integration there. And we talk a lot about governance and provenance in MarkLogic. So we're keeping track of the provenance of all your data. Apache NiFi is really good at keeping track of the provenance of the flows themselves. So we can integrate even information about the flows and the processes that took place to get that data into MarkLogic because that's an important part of the provenance of your data as well. So we think there's a great fit between NiFi and MarkLogic. We built that integration. Uh, you're gonna be seeing more and more pieces of that rolling out over time as open source, again, from us, fully supported, no cost. Pick it up today, give us your feedback. Okay, so you heard Gary talking about API first. So you've, you've defined your business needs, you've built your APIs, you've used NiFi to get that data into uh, MarkLogic, and now you wanna use that data for something valuable, of course, that's the whole point. Your API might be about you know, um, dynamic pricing. You might have a customer coming into your website and you wanna compute the uh, price of a particular product offering based on that particular customer's uh, background and, uh, and other information. Or you might be looking at customers looking for fraud. You might have a fraud-based API. Uh, but in any of those scenarios, you want to take the data from all of those different systems, the support system, the sales system, the loyalty card system. You wanna take everything you know about your customers and integrate it in the hub. That's the whole point of the hub, getting this 360 degree view of customers or partners or patients, whatever it might be. You wanna create that view. 
um, so that those APIs that you built have the best possible data to work on. All the data you have about that customer, you can bring to bear in computing the best dynamic price, for example. Um, but you know, it's, it's actually a little bit harder than it sounds. Because let's take this example. We've got Pat Richards, who's a customer. And we've got a record about her in our loyalty system. And we've got another one in the support system, and another one in the sales system, and another one in the credit system. And we want to bring all that data together and use it. But you know, when she first bought a product from us, uh, she entered her name as Pat Richards, which is not surprising, because that's her name. But when she called support, and they asked her name, she gave her full name. She said, my name is Patricia Richards, and that's what was entered in the support system. And then in the loyalty card system, her name's actually misspelled, just a typo. So, and, and on and on. And so, you know, when she bought her first product, she lived at one address. And then when she called support six months later, she had moved. So you've got all these records about the same, you know, actual human being, but you couldn't tell by looking at them. They have different names, they have different addresses. And so you may think you have five times as many customers you, as you actually have because you know, there, you've got all these different records that look like different people. But if you want your APIs, if you want that dynamic pricing API or that fraud API to work really well, you need to master that. You need to have a single place where you can say, this is Pat Richards, this is this human being. All this data from all these different systems, they're referring to the same person. And if you look inside that data hub graphic, you'll see this unassuming little box uh, called smart mastering. And that's the second thing that we're introducing today. Smart mastering is an incredible collection of technology that can, can do fuzzy thinking. And what I mean by that is it can look at a record that says Patricia Richards and a record that says Pat Richards and say, well, you know, um, Pat and Patricia, those are often the same name. And it can look at misspellings and say, oh, uh, it says Richards, but that's probably Richards. Uh, and it can look at address changes, not just as separate things, but correlated with the other data, and build a confidence and say, hey, I looked at all these you know, 10 different records, and I actually think that they're the same person. And here's my level of confidence based on all these different factors that I've looked at that tells me that I believe that this is the same person. And do that intelligently. Do it in a smart way. That's why we call it smart mastering. And then having done that, merge those records together. So you have a master record that refers to Pat Richards and gives you all of that data about Pat. And do it again in the mark logic way. What do I mean by that? I mean that we're not going to take all those original records and throw them away and replace them with a new record. We leave all of the original data there and create a new record for Pat that is linked back to all of the original data. We don't decide, well, this is the best phone number. I'm going to throw all the other phone numbers away. How many salespeople are in the audience? Um, there's a few of our salespeople in the audience. Um, I, I can guarantee you if you go to a salesperson and say, would you be okay with me throwing away information about our customers? Um, they will not be happy with that. You want to keep all of the information you have about your customers, your partners, whatever it is those entities are that you're mastering. And by the way, you want to be able to do this all temporally. Again, this is the Mark Logic way. So let's imagine that I have two records. I've got a record that's over here in the support system that says, Joe Pasqua lives at address A with phone number B, et cetera. And this other system also says, Joe Pasqua, same address, same phone number, all that stuff. Well, boy, I'm going to have a high confidence that that's the same person until I realize that it's a father and a son living in the same house. So sometimes you make mistakes. And even people make mistakes doing that kind of thing. And you may find later when the father calls in and says, hey, why, why do you think I have a terrible credit rating? Well, that's because we thought it was your son and he's got a terrible credit rating. Um, so you want to be able to unmerge things as well. And you want to be able to go back and take that 
uh, merge record apart, go back, make them two separate records. And you want to keep the provenance of this and the lineage of this throughout the whole process. You want to know, here's the information I had. Here's the basis I used to merge the records together. They were merged for this period of time. I found out I made an error. I unmerged them. I've got all that lineage history. The customer calls back and say, why did you do this on this day? You know why, because you have that, all that lineage and, and all that provenance. So smart mastering gives you all of that and a lot more that I don't have time to talk about. Fortunately, there's a full session on this this afternoon at around 4 o'clock, I think. So be sure to go to that session. Smart mastering, available today, available in GitHub. Go, go take a look at it. You're going to really like it. You're going to like the integration with the MarkLogic Data Hub. OK, you got your data in. Thank you. Okay. You got your data in. You've mastered it. You're ready to do cool things. And your CIO comes down and he says, hey, really good job. Love everything you're doing. Um, but you know, I've heard of, uh, more and more about this whole cloud thing and how agile it'll make us. And, and if there's one thing we need, it's to be agile. So I'd really like it if you could figure out a way to do all of this and do it in the cloud. And by the way, um, I'm not sure which cloud we're going to use, so make sure it runs on any cloud. And we may not be doing this for a while, so whatever you do, it also has to run on premise. And by the way, after we pick a cloud, I want to go to cloud vendor A and threaten them with cloud vendor B's pricing. So make sure we can move if we have to. Um, OK, that would be great. Um, you know, want to have that agility. So, um, so start working on that. Oh, oh, one other thing. Um, this is like some of our company's most sensitive information. So be sure when it's up in the cloud, it's super secure. Um, I don't want you to lose your job over a data breach, so make sure that this is, is secure. Um, and, and just the one last thing I had heard about cloud is that cloud could be really good if you use it the right way, but it can also have really, really high costs if you do it the wrong way. So if you could get me this agility and get me this security and get me this cost-effective cloud architecture, and if you could get it to me by next Wednesday, that would be awesome. <laughs> I won't ask you how many of you have had a conversation with a CIO that, that went along those lines. Um, but this is what we're trying to solve for you. You know MarkLogic already runs really well in the cloud really agile, the most secure system running in the cloud, as Gary talked about. And what we're adding today is how we make that the most cost-effective database in the cloud. And let me tell you why it's hard. It's hard because your workload doesn't look like that. It's not flat and predictable and, and easy. It looks more like this. Um, somebody described this as your EKG during a tax audit. Um, <laughs> So it, it's really spiky and unpredictable. Um, and this is what you're dealing with day to day. Um, and you want to you know, deal with this kind of load, but do it in a cost-effective way. And you know, we all know you can't provision for peaks. You'd go broke provisioning for peaks. Because that might be 5x your normal workload. And you don't want to have all that capacity lying around. Um, but you also don't want to provision for average. Because if you're doing that, you're, you're going to be upsetting customers because you're going to be slowing down their operations. And frankly, you might be leaving money on the table. Because if customers are coming to you and your service isn't available to them, they're going to go someplace else. So you don't want a provision for average. What you'd really like is you know, the best of both worlds. I'd like to have you know, the average predictable part of my workload uh, purchased in kind of a long-term, you know, very cost-effective way. But I'd also like to be able to deal with those spikes. Um, but traditionally, with the cloud, you know, when you're buying hourly resources, that's the most expensive way to buy. So today, we're introducing the MarkLogic query service. And what the MarkLogic query service does is it takes advantage of MarkLogic's really unique architecture to create the most cost-effective solution in the cloud. 
And the way that we do that, if you think about it, is the hard part of adding resources in the cloud for a database is the data, but that's pretty important to a database. The reason the cloud works so well for dynamic resources for most things is they don't have any data, they're stateless. You can bring in a server, it just starts working. It doesn't need its own data. When you're done with the server, shoot it in the head. No problem, you're not gonna lose any information. But you can't do that with a database. Database, you know, you bring in more capacity in the database, it needs data to operate on. And dealing with that data and migrating data and repartitioning and rebalancing, that's slow. And you don't have time to do that when you're dealing with spikes. But the great thing about Mark Logic is, I learned this yesterday, from version two of Mark Logic, we've had a separation inside of our internal architecture. We separate the part of Mark Logic that does the computation, the stateless part, from the part that manages data. And that's been around, as I say, since version two. And what that means is you can add capacity to evaluate queries. We call them e-nodes or evaluator nodes. You can add that capacity just like that. In fact, with the latest release of Mark Logic, you can add an e-node to a cluster in less than a second. Amazingly fast. And that capacity is available immediately to help you deal with spikes. As soon as the spikes are gone, take it away. No data rebalancing, no data shifting in and out of the cluster really quickly. And what the Mark Logic Query Service does is it does all that for you. So you can basically go to the query service and say, I want elastic capacity. Here's the kinds of spikes that I expect to deal with. Just make sure I have capacity for that. And we'll watch your load on your system. And as you have new load coming in, if it's needed, we'll add that capacity and we'll add it in a second. When that uh, peak has passed, we'll take that capacity away. And that's all automatic, all provisioned, all managed by the service. You don't have to do anything in your application. You don't have to do anything differently. Um, and we'll be reactive. So when we see those spikes, we'll react to them and, and add capacity. But we'll also learn over time and we'll become predictive so that we'll learn your patterns and that way be able to add capacity when we know it's coming, when we know it's going to be needed. So this is the Mark Logic Query Service. You'll hear more about that um, over the next few days. This is available next month in June. Uh, it goes along with uh, something else that a number of you have been asking for, which is a cloud managed service. So if you just want uh, us to help you transition to, to the cloud or run your services in the cloud, we can work with you to create a managed cloud service for you as well. And I know it, from conversations that I've had with a number of you, that's really the direction you want to take as your first step uh, towards the cloud. So Mark Logic Query Service available next month, Mark Logic Managed Service, talk about it, them to us today. Uh, and actually, over the course of the rest of the year, you'll be hearing about more Mark Logic services in the cloud. And I wish I had more time to, to talk to you about this, but I know I'm already over. So I'm going to leave it there. Three great new technologies. Um, look at, at them in GitHub. Go get them, try them out, use them, and definitely go to the Lightning Talk tomorrow. See Smart Mastering in action. I'm sorry. Um, uh, NiFi in action, go to the session today on smart mastering and learn how it all works. Thank you very much.